welcome to everyone. Before we start off with our worship service this morning, some quick announcements. Um, next Sunday is the first quarter seniors fellowship and also the January to April birthday celebrants of our celebration of our seniors. So that's Sunday, April 14, following the service at the church basement. Um, everyone is uh, requested to register. Um, also, a reminder that we are filling up our door-to-door -door boxes for our medical dental mission trip in August. And uh, the last day to do it will be next Sunday because we are shipping out the boxes on Monday. So a reminder to everyone about that one. And also our night of worship and prayer is the third Wednesday, April 17 at 7 p.m. here at the church. And we are also having a children's ministry volunteers uh, training that will be April 21st. So all uh, volunteers, please uh, mark off your calendar and register as well. And also um, April 27th, Saturday at 9 a.m. is our annual church sp uh, spring cleaning day. So if you are able to uh, help out, uh, please mark your calendar. That's April 27th, Saturday at 9 a.m. And last off, um, is the CFAM Joint Family Camp, which will be held August 9 to 12 at Camp Hope, Hope, BC. So if you are interested to attend, uh, please see Pastor String or Pastor Iman or the church office. Thank you and have a, oh, check out uh, everything else at www.cachurch.ca. Thank you and have a blessed day. Again, good morning, church. It's nice to be in the house of the Lord today. Let's all stand up. For those of you at home, thank you for joining us. And we would like you to comment in there where you are watching, where you are from, so we can pray for you as well. Psalm 150. Praise the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty heavens. Praise Him for His acts of power. Praise Him for His surpassing greatness. Praise Him with the sounding of trumpet. Praise Him with the harp and lyre. Praise Him with the timbrel and dancing. Praise Him with springs and pipe. Praise Him with clash of cymbals. And praise Him with the resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Amen. Let's praise the Lord God for all the good things that He had done in our lives. Amen? Yeah. 
Baby 
Amen. Let's give the Lord a clap offering. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Praise the Lord. Welcome to the house of the Lord and uh, praise the Lord. Today is the day that the Lord has made and truly we rejoice and we, we are so glad in it, right? So praise the Lord, truly. Amen. Hey, welcome to Central Edmonton Alliance Church. Thank you for being here. For those of you who are listening and watching us online, we're on YouTube live as well. And so just in case you want to just go there and uh, search us over, uh, Central Edmonton Alliance Church, and you'll be able to be directed towards the YouTube channel. We are live there, and it stays there for as much as we would like it to be there. Welcome, and we just would like, before we call on our children here, uh, up here to pray for them, we just would like to welcome some of our guests today. Thank you for being here. We want to welcome Dusty. Dusty, would you please rise and stand? If you are able, if you're okay with it, thank you. Welcome. We have David and Claire. David, Claire, there you go. David, Claire, sorry. Uh, Gloria and Michael. Hey, welcome, Gloria and Michael. And also a friend of our guest speaker today is with us, Reverend Brent Farquhar. There you go. Welcome. Thank you, thank you. Praise the Lord. Uh, I'm going to call up the children to be here, and uh, we will be praying for you. Kids, come up. All right. As Elder Rolly was just saying a while ago, a few Sundays back, the Lord has been blessing us biologically, like adding us more and more kids, right, year after year. And that's good because, like, the next generation of this church will be these children. And uh, we look forward to that day that, uh, you know, uh, they will be the ones who would be uh, doing the ministry here at church. All right. <clears throat> would you join me in prayer? Let's pray for the kids. Father, we thank you for all these little children before us. Thank you, O Lord, because you have given them life and people that love them, people that take care of them. And so, Father, we pray that they would continue to develop and grow spiritually, mentally as well, emotionally, and also as they grow physically. Lord, we pray that they will continue to know you more in their lives as they grow up. Uh, God, we pray that they would also be in one way or the other, and however that would look like for them, that they would boldly also share Jesus with their friends. And so, Lord, we also pray that they would have godly friends around them, so that as they grow in a very diverse, complex culture that we are in, Lord, that Jesus will continue to just nurture their hearts and make them the children that you wanted them to be. Father, we pray for the parents and the guardians of these kids. Thank you for their lives and for their commitment to really not only show them love, but really love them and uh, continue to just be there for them. We pray, O oh Lord, for the parents as well, that they would also grow in their knowledge and in their relationship with you. Uh, we pray that they would have that wisdom and the guidance from the Holy Spirit as they raise these little children. We pray, O oh Lord, for opportunities of spiritual conversations with their children during the week, intentionally recognizing teachable moments and continuing spiritual conversations with these little kids. Father, with the business of life, uh, we pray that they would really allocate and commit a time that they would spend with their little children as they grow God, we pray for our teachers, Sunday school teachers downstairs today. Thank you, O oh Lord, for their lives, for volunteering, for the prepping, and, and for all the things that they do for these kids so that they will continue to grow and learn more about Jesus and your word. So we pray for Sharon as she leads this ministry, our children's ministry. Thank you, O oh Lord, for her life. Thank you for her commitment and the team that works alongside her. God, we pray that you will bless them together as they continue to minister and serve you in the area of helping our kids grow in their faith in Jesus. Thank you once again, O Lord, for these little children as you have blessed them way, then, way back then during your time. He said, don't prevent the kids to come to me because the likes of them is what the kingdom looks like. And so, Father, bless these little children in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, amen. All right, children, go to your 
Sound is cool. Make sure parents you send them in and send them out later. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. All good. Uh, just before I pray for the congregation and for the tithes and the offering, uh, just a reminder as well that uh, the boxes that we are about to send to the Philippines for the mission trip is the last Sunday to give, whether in cash or in kind, uh, should be next Sunday because we're sending them out on April 15. So please do remember that. The boxes are up. up. One, we have one here upstairs and there are more in the basement. So there's more in the basement. So just for you to know. And uh, let's, let's close our eyes by our heads. Let's close our eyes by our heads. Let's pray. Father, today we give you praise and we give you thanks for just being here, really, brothers and sisters, in worshiping and honoring you. Uh, thank you for this wonderful day, a brand new day that you have given us. We always say that life in itself is a miracle. And today we are alive and we praise and we thank you, Lord, for giving us the gift of life. And anything else that you give to this life, Lord, we call them extra miracles from you. And truly, in our heart of hearts, we say we are more than grateful and forever grateful. Father, the complexities of life and the incomprehensibleness sometimes of our values and our distinct life situations and all of this makes us realize and even acknowledge our nothingness, our helplessness, and our limitations that tells us that we really need you, Lord. We need your love, your grace, your special touch and blessing. For without you, we are nothing. We can do nothing apart from you. We cannot live and even survive without your sovereign and your sustaining love. So when we are sick, it reminds us that you are our healer, Lord. When we are financially broke and struggling and being challenged, you are indeed our provider. When we are in trouble, you are our peace. When we feel we are lost, you are our good shepherd who brings us back to the fold. In the other parts of the world that we live in, where there are wars, famine, persecution of Christians, we look up to you and we pray for your peace to overrule the ongoing chaos. We pray for the government agencies and humanitarian organizations, and even, Lord, the Christian organizations, including us, the Alliance, and even churches all around the world, that you'd provide for us and for all of us unity, and even, Lord, the resources to address the pressing needs that we are seeing happening around the world. Father, today we are embarking on a new sermon series, The Spirit-Filled Life. And our guest speaker today would talk about the small and powerful tongue. Really, Lord, our culture apparently has had a strong influence over the way we see things and the way we respond to them as well. Social media has somehow taken or stolen our attention to you and especially to your word. Instead of the culture invading our Christian life, it should rather be the other way around. Our Christian culture, biblical culture, should invade our current culture. So help us, therefore, to do this by your grace and by your strength. Our church and the rest of the Christian churches all over the world would have a major role to help us take our stand for you. Brothers and sisters, I'm going to give you a minute or two to say your prayers to the Lord today. So in silence, you can talk to the Lord right now and just let him know what's in your heart. Or you be thankful for him for anything else, do the thanksgiving prayer. And for anything else, speak from the heart and let the Lord know your prayers.
Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayers. Your word reminds us that we should not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, making our prayers made known to you. And the peace of God, which is in Christ Jesus, will guard our hearts and our minds. Thank you once again for listening to our prayers. And in your sovereign will, we submit, Lord, however you would answer our prayers, for your glory and for your honor, for the church's sake. For this we pray in Jesus' name, all of God's people said, Amen and Amen. As the ushers would come in, uh, we have two types of offering today. As first Sunday is our regular giving, and also after this, uh, after regular giving, we would also have uh, our benevolent fund uh, giving. That, that is to help uh, people who are in need, and that happens every first Sunday of the month. So we have two types of uh, giving today. Um, let me read for us Leviticus 27, verse 30. Every tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the trees, is the Lord's. It is holy, holy to the Lord. First Chronicles 29, verse 14. But who am I and what is my people that we should be able to thus to offer willingly? For all things come from you and of your own have we given you. Let us pray. God, we have been made in your image so in your generosity, make us generous today. In your faithfulness, make us faithful today. So that whatever gift we bring to you might be an offer of worship to you. As the gold, frankincense, and mirror were before your son, Jesus Christ. In whose name we pray and all of God's people said, Amen. Let's give as the Lord has given us. When the benevolent offering is happening, I will be introducing our guest speaker this morning. Benevolent offering is intended to, uh, once again, help those brothers and sisters of ours who are in dire need, uh, to give them a little bit of a lift and comfort. So we can now start give for the benevolent offering. And on our screen, I'll be introducing our guest speaker for today. Maybe for most of us, uh, we might have known him already, but for those who haven't met him yet, or have seen him yet, or heard him yet, that would be a good time for us to know a little bit of our speaker for today. Our speaker for today is Dr. T.V. Thomas. Up until today, I've never have discovered yet what TV actually stands for. And he says that it's going to be in heaven that we all shall know what TV stands for. So let's leave it that way. Anyways, Dr. T.V. Thomas was born in Malacca, Malaysia, and uh, he studied in Malaysia, India, Canada, and the United States of America. The Thomases have three adult children. Uh, Dr. Thomas is founder and director of the Center for Evangelism and World Mission, founded in 1984 in Regina, Canada. For four decades, TV has enjoyed transdenominational and transcontinental ministry of speaking, teaching, consulting, and networking. So from 1984 to 1994, Dr. Thomas served as the professor of evangelism for the Murray W. Doney Chair of Evangelism at Canadian Theological Seminary, uh, formerly CTS. Now it's Ambrose University, I guess, right? So his deep commitment to the cause of world evangelization calls for extensive national and even international travel to minister at camps, churches, colleges, seminaries, retreats, seminars, conferences, and consultations. TV has been a plenary speaker at Urbana, Student Missions Convention, Keswick Conventions, Missions Fest, Ethnic Ministries, Summits, and even Promise Keepers Conference. Dr. Thomas currently serves on numerous national and international boards, chairs the board of directors for Full Spectrum Network, Lausanne Global Diaspora Network, GDN, co-chair of the International Network of South Asian Diaspora. Leaders, uh, I-N-S-A-D-L, Vice Chair of uh, MECO, Canada Board of Advisor to Luzon, Canada. He also serves on the Perspectives Canada National Team and its Multicultural Intercultural Ministries Consultant for the Alliance Canada. And that is where CFAM falls under. So he is our consultant, actually. And he works with the National Executive Committee where me as your pastor is part of that one, too. So uh, let's all welcome uh, a good friend of ours, Dr. T.B. Thomas.
Uh, good morning. I'm glad to be back at uh, what was known as FFAC, now a Central Edmonton Alliance Church. And I'm glad to be with uh, Pastor Israel and, and glad to know that he has completed over 10 years of ministry at this church. I just cannot believe how 10 years went by uh, since he came. Uh, as he said, I work with him on the Sea Farm Executive uh, uh, as an advisor to, to that. This weekend, I was here to uh, be with the Vietnamese executive that met the last three days and I had the privilege to, uh, to be here this morning. Uh, I just want to say a word of my, a word to, of my friend, Reverend uh, Brent Farquhar. I've known him for over 30 years. Uh, he has been a pastor for many years. He has even been an assistant superintendent of our central district back in Ontario. And he is perhaps one of the newest residents of Alberta because he moved here uh, less than two months ago. And uh, so he, he, he's beginning to become a Westerner. So let's give him a Western Canada welcome. Uh, 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 just a few weeks ago, I was back in, uh, in, the, in the Gulf countries, and of course my favorite breakfast in, from, the Filipino, from the Philippines is Jolly Bees. Uh, you know, I like uh, uh, corned beef with rice and egg, and I cannot just eat one, I have to order two. So when I go to the counter and say, I need two, they're looking at who else is here, and I said, no. I am double your size, I need double the food. Uh, and so I enjoyed that. And of course, um, you need to know in the UAE, there are 20 locations of Jolly Bees in the UAE, between UAE, uh, between uh, Abu Dhabi, uh, you know, uh, uh, Dubai, Alain, all those places. But I also enjoy uh, uh, Halo Halo, my favorite uh, dessert is Halo Halo, uh, that's how he bribed me to come here. Uh, he said he promised me hello, hello if I show up. And uh, I'm looking forward to finishing my sermon and enjoying my hello, hello. Uh, but in Chow King, uh, Chow King has the best hello, hello. Uh, when Chow King first started with hello, hello, they were not as good. They have improved because I've critiqued it every time and they've improved it. Now I tell you, it's pretty good. Obviously, it's not as good as the Hilton Manila Halo Halo, uh, which is uh, several times more expensive and bigger in size with a lot of ube and 11 scoops of ice cream. I, I was caught with this situation where I'd, I'd gone to speak at the, at the uh, conf uh, 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 Chinese church conference. Uh, they took me out for dinner, of course, 13 course meal. Uh, and then, he, then they, before they dropped me off, they said, we're going to take you to one place. They took me to Hilton, uh, Hilton Manila. Uh, and then they ordered a uh, hello, hello. But when they brought it, I thought it was for everybody. But later, quickly, I found out it was just for me. 11 scoops of ice cream for five colors with all the fruits and all that. I ate that halo halo slowly, and it took me an hour and a half to finish two thirds. Because I've already finished 13 course meal at the other restaurant. And that explains why I look the size I am. Uh, great to be here, and, and let's pray as we look into God's Word. Father, we pray that you will, uh, the very Spirit of God that gave us the Word of God will be the very Spirit that will speak to us, minister to us, not just as a group, but also as individuals. Because, Lord, this was written so that we will be 
uh, we will be edified to become men and women of God that reflect the character that you desire for us to have. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. One of God's marvelous gifts to humans is the ability to speak. Our speech is a faculty which differentiates man or humans from animals. And speech is possible only because of the tongue. And the tongue is very, a very small member compared to the physical structure you and I have. But friends, this, the tongue is small, but very, very important. The tongue is small, but very, very powerful. It is so important and powerful that James gives us a detailed understanding of what the tongue does and how it functions. And for, therefore, it's important for us to take the many verses of Scripture that's given in James 3 and see how it applies to all of us. So he gives very graphic descriptions. First of all, he gives us two analogies of the tongue. So in verses 3 and 4 of James 3, of the first of the analogy comes in verse 3. Now, if we put the bits into the horse's mouth so that they will obey us, we direct their entire body as well. The tongue is like a bit in a horse's mouth. Now, I, country, I come from the country of Malaysia, and when I was growing up, I did not see many horses. The only horses I saw was once, once, or, two, once or twice a year, there'll be a circus that will come through, and there'll be some circuses in the ring. But I've never touched a horse in all the time I grew up in Malaysia. The first horse I touched was up in Darjeeling in the northeast part of India. So friends, I'm not very familiar with horses, but if you have ridden a horse, you will know the bit is a very magical tool. The bit is a very small curved piece of metal that weighs less than a pound, but it is powerful to direct a very, very heavy, powerful animal. A thin piece of leather is attached to the bit as the bit is put in the horse's mouth. And by pulling the leather from side to side, the rider is able to control this very strong, powerful animal, often a nearly a thousand pounds. You see, the bit is small, but very powerful under the rider's control. Less than a pound, but able to manipulate a thousand pound animal. So is it with the tongue. The analogy of the bit communicates how it can control the whole body. Then James goes on and gives us the second analogy in verse 4. Verse 4 reads, look at the ships also. He has just given one. He is now giving another analogy. He says, look at the ships. Though they are so great and are driven by strong winds, are still directed by a very small rudder, wherever the inclination of the pilot desires. So the second analogy James uses, he says, the tongue is like a rudder of a ship. During James's day, the way of cross, uh, uh, cross national travel was across the seas through sailing ships. The great sailing ships were super dependent upon strong winds. Strong winds from behind helped the ships to move forward, but the controlling device of the ship was not the strong winds. It was the small but powerful rudder. The rudder is often hidden to most of us. 
unless it comes on dry dock or it's taken out, you will never see the rudder. But friends, the rudder is what the pilot operates with to move the ship in the direction it wants it to go. He is able to navigate a large vessel with this small rudder under the water. Similarly, the tongue, though small, when properly used, can give direction and exert significance uh, uh, influence on other people. Therefore, the analogy of the rudder communicates the direction to the body. So two analogies. The bit gives control. The rudder gives direction. James, after describing these two analogies, he goes on to give us three illustrations so that we will clearly understand how the tongue functions. In verses 5 to 12, we see the three illustrations. Illustration one, he says the tongue is a fire. Let me read verses 5 and 6. So also the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. See how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire, and the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life and is set on fire by hell. Friends, look at verse 6. It says, the small tongue sets on fire the course of our life. The course of our life. The small tongue first kindles a small fire. And that small fire could become a forest fire. And that forest fire could wipe out an entire forest. Friends, I want to tell you, never did I think when I came to Canada several years ago in a city like Regina, which is absolutely on flat land. And if you want, every tree in Regina has been planted by a human being. Because the rest, if you didn't, didn't plant, it won't grow. Wheat may, but not trees. And, and yet, last year when I was overseas, my, my wife tells me, you know, we cannot do many activities outside. We cannot hold our picnic of, of the Bible study group that we are part of. Why? Because of the quality of the air. We didn't have a fire in Regina. We didn't have a fire in the central part of the province. And yet, friends, the quality was not adequate and no picnic or many outdoor activities had to be canceled because of the smoke that came and of course, some of you sent it from Alberta, northern Alberta. Uh, I'll spare you. It didn't come from Edmonton. It came north of here. Uh, and, uh, and, and it came in BC. And it affected us. When I came back in August, after several weeks overseas, I could not believe we even had to cancel another activity. Uh, so friends, you know about forest fires. And I'm told this year, they, they have decided to, uh, uh, to put the teams in operation so that they can have uh, 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 better preparation for forest fires. Friends, you know what forest fires do. They wipe out. And you've seen enough uh, pictures, enough uh, 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 the screen has been filled with fires and the, uh, the, the devastation that is caused. Uh, caused. Similarly, friends, the fire sparks in the hub of our lives. Where's the hub of our lives? The tongue. 
And the words, uh, the words of a tongue that begin in the center of our being can also inflame the whole life. The tongue can defile. The tongue can ruin ourselves, but it can also ruin other people. So friends, uh, inappropriate words can create havoc in one's life, but it can create havoc in other people's lives. So what, is, what did James say? What's the source of this fire? James gives us the answer in verse 6. It's set on fire by hell. And the word for hell that's used here is Gehenna. And Gehenna was the name of Jerusalem's garbage dump. Everybody in Jerusalem knew where Gehenna was because that garbage dump was where all the garbage was put, all the animal parts were thrown in, and even some dead bodies were thrown in. And the fire in Gehenna was 24-7. That's the only way to take care of the stench factor in the city of Jerusalem. People knew where Gehenna was. Awful smell. It burned 24-7. James asserts that destructive fire that defiles and ruins is from hell, but is ignited by the tongue. Ignited by the tongue. Awful consequences take place. Therefore, the Christian should not underestimate the value of what he says And what they hear. Because words can build up. But words can also destroy. Words can strengthen relationships. But also can destroy relationships. And that is why David issued this prayer. Applicable to every generation. Including us. In Psalm 143, or 41. Verse 3 says, set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Provide protection. Let not words that are inappropriate spill out because it could cause a fire. It could burn up beautiful relationships. It could devastate uh, uh, bridges of friendship. Oh, Lord, let the wrong words not come out. Lord, God, Guard my tongue. The fire describes the scope of, trend, uh, of destruction. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 15, verses 16 to 20. Listen very carefully. Jesus said, are you still lacking in understanding also? Do you not understand that everything that goes into the mouth passes into the stomach? And is eliminated. But the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart. And those defile the man. For out of the heart evil come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications. Thefts, false witness, slanders, these are the things which defile the man. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile the man. See, eating with unwashed hands may create some illness, some discomfort, 
But friends, uh, but, uh, but it does not morally corrupt you or pervert you. But in verses 18 and 19, uh, it's quoting verses uh, uh, from Jeremiah 17, verse 9. The heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? Friends, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, it's very clear we need to guard our heart. So one of the songs that you are singing, uh, you know, about purifying a heart because that is where the words come from. That is where the wrong words can come from. If God purifies our heart, if God guards our mouth, then we will speak words of healing, words of encouragement. So the lesson for us since the tongue is so very powerful, we better be careful about what we say because our, our tongues can destroy our personal lives, but our own words can destroy relationships in whatever context. In the family, angry words can tear a family apart. In the community of believers, like a church, a rumor and gossips can cause disharmony uh, confusion, disunity in the community where you work in, the office where you work in, the, the, uh, the, the, the floor where you work in as a health professional. It can erupt suspicion and fear or even hatred. The scope of devastation and the destruction by the tongue is beyond anybody's calculation. I've heard just too many people say, I never thought it will go this far. Or I never thought it will go in so many directions. And worse still to say, I never thought the rupture will be for so long. Friends, the tongue is a fire. The second illustration is the tongue is a deadly poison. James 3, verses 7 and 8 says, For every species of beasts and birds and reptiles and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by the human race. But no one can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil and full of deadly poison. Friends, when I, when the worst thing I can think of deadly poison is a snake. I hate snakes. Not because I'm a Christian. I hated snakes before I read Genesis 1, 2, and 3. I just hate snakes. Even a dead one, I do not want to look at. But when I did my science degree, I had to look at snakes that were put in those big jars and tried to draw, pick, uh, draw their scales and their eyes. Oh, glory be to God the day I passed. I don't have to look at snakes again. Oh, friends, I'm going to tell you, the tropics are full of snakes. Several of them are poisonous, and we had several of them in Malaysia. And I ate all snakes whether they're in science labs or whether they are in bottles, it doesn't matter. But what does a snake do? How does the snake destroy? It comes, it strikes, it passes on the venom, and then it disappears. It doesn't wait around to see who is coming. It comes strikes, passes on the venom. And sometimes when you meet the victim, we do not know what kind of snake uh, bit him unless he, can, he or she can say it. We sometimes are even unaware in which direction the snake slithers us. But one thing is sure, the victim is left in crisis. 
the tongue can also do the same thing. It can strike, deliver the poison, and the venom is powerful and deadly, even to the very spirit of a person needing inner healing. So friends, you need to know there are words that, that hurt us, but then there are words that crush us. My office for 20 years was in the same building where Regina's first Christian counseling center was located. I didn't do counseling. I sit with their counselors sometimes at lunch. And without giving any confidential material or name, they will talk about people, increasing number of people coming in, not just non-Christians, but Christians, who are crushed in their spirit. Counseling is not enough for them. They need inner healing. And it's not always instant. Takes time to sort out the source of that, those words that crush them. It takes time to nurture them back to full health and full perspective. Oh, friends, the deadly poison describes the severity of the destruction. The fire, the scope. The deadly poison, the severity. No wonder James says in verse 8 that no one can tame the tongue. No one can master the tongue. You see, uh, James says you can tame animals. You can tame beasts. You know, wild animals are brought into circuses because they've been tamed. Uh, you can tame birds. You can uh, tame uh, parrots and parakeets to give a greeting to visitors as they walk into your house. Uh, they, you can tame reptiles. Uh, you know, go throughout uh, South Asia. You'll see snake charmers in many, uh, many streets. Uh, what do they do? They take this very poisonous snake, but they make them uh, make them dance, and they collect a few pennies from those who are around. Friends, but James says, no one can tame the tongue. There's only one person who can master the tongue, and the person is the one who gave the tongue to you. Only God can tame your tongue. but you must let him tame your tongue. Only the power of God can control the tongue. Our cure is God himself. So the tongue is a fire. Talking about the scope of destruction. The tongue is a deadly poison. Talking about the severity of that destruction. Thirdly, he says, the tongue is a fountain. Verses 9 to 12. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who are made, who are made in the likeness of men. From the same tongue come both blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be this way. There's a fountain sent out from the same opening, both fresh and bitter water. Can a fig tree, my brethren, produce olives, or a wine produce figs? Nor can salt water produce fresh. James says the tongue is a fountain. As a fountain, it is a source of blessing, or it's a source of destruction. So we read from scripture and also know from personal experience that our tongues can either be a source of blessing 
or a source of cursing. It could be a fountain of life. Or it could be a fountain of death. The tongue can be a source of blessing. It can be refreshing. It can be uplifting. It can be encouraging with joyful optimism. On the other hand, the same tongue can be the source of cursing, the source of gossip, the source of pessimism, the source of discouragement, the source of condemnation, the source of slander, the source of false witness, and many, many others. Listen to the clear warnings of scripture. There's many verses. I'm going to just give two to you. Proverbs 10, verses 18 to 19. He who conceals hatred has lying lips. And he who spreads slander is a fool, not intellectually, but is the enemy of God. That's what fool means there. Who who spreads slander is the enemy of God. When there are many words, transgression is unavoidable. But he who restrains his lips, he who says, Lord, guard my lips. Guard my mouth is wise. Proverbs 15 verse 4, a soothing tongue is a tree of life. But perversion in it crushes the spirit. For the friends, we must steer the traffic of our words. We need God's help. We need to think what we're going to say. Let me close with something very practical that I've developed over several years. And I can say the last 25 years I've used this and it has been almost full, uh, proof guarantee. Let me pass those four tests to you. How can we be careful to handle the small and powerful tongue? Here's the fourfold test for, for speech. We must practice a quick fourfold test before we speak. And the sequence I'm going to give you is very important as well. Number one, first question to ask, is it true? Is it partially true or is it fully true? Ephesians 4.15 says, we need to speak the truth in love. We are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. What does speak the truth in love mean? We speak gently, but firmly. We speak truth saturated with love. Or truth encapsulated by love. Now, most of you have taken some tablets sometime in your life. Some tablets uh, are just tablets. The medicine is just tablets. It may have pink, yellow, blue, white. But some medication is in a capsule. And sometimes they're colorful capsules, double color. Why? No, they're not into artistic uh, wizardry here. Why is it in a capsule? Because the medication in the capsule, you, are, you need them but it's awful to taste. 
So they capsule it. Prevent you from having a bad experience. You swallow it. Don't allow it to be melting in your mouth. Then you will have the, the, the terror of that awful, bitter, uh, uh, bitter medication. Say, so friends, truth without love is a sledgehammer. It's destructive. Yes, I can speak truth. But I speak truth without love is a sledgehammer. But love without truth is not truth. Love without truth is sentimentality. It's superficial. It's falseness. Our intention should be to use our tongue to help the person Build up the person. So it's important to check the facts. Just because somebody said it doesn't make it right or true. Check the facts. Sometimes you have to check the source of those facts. That's why these days there's fact check. Every speaker... Every politician, there's a fact check. Why? There's a lot of things that pass to the audience which is not fully true. So the first question, what I'm going to say, is it fully true? The second test, is it kind? Would it be gracious to say this? Is it harsh to the hearer? Psalm 34 verse 13 says, Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. The question is, is it kind? Is it edifying? Is it positive? Is it comforting? Third question. Is it necessary? It may be true. It may be kind. But it may not be necessary to be spelt out. Maybe not the right place. Is it necessary? Am I doing common good? Am I being helpful by repeating it? Am I saying this for the common good or for the greater good? Is it unifying? Or is it dividing? Is it giving clarity or are you muddying the situation? Is, is it going to build up the body of Christ? By repeating it, repeating it, repeating it, is it helpful for the situation? So everything that is true and everything that is kind may not be necessary at all places. Fourth question. Is it true? Is it kind? Is it necessary? Fourth question is, is it wise? And that depends upon three sub-questions. Is it to the right person or persons? Let me tell you a common thing that happens in many circles, including churches, is this. Some people have, think that uh, 
Complaining is a spiritual gift. And they exercise it freely. I don't see it in my scripture, but I guess they have a scripture that I don't have. Friends, nothing wrong with complaining. Let me tell you how. There's, there is a place for complaining. Suppose we had a church picnic. Everything was organized. And suddenly somebody didn't bring drinks for the children. They forgot to pick up the yellow tub from the golden arches. Those kids are playing, having a great time, and suddenly they're thirsty, and they look around, there's no drinks, there's drinks for adults. I think for children. That can happen. But you know, the person, if you are upset about it, you need to talk to the right person. It's okay to go to the organizers and say, you know, that's very unfortunate. But most times what happens? The same person would not talk to the right person. They will go around and say, you know, wasn't that awful? You know, Jesus loved children. Jesus made children number one priority. But our leaders, people plan the big they are callous. Then three weeks later, they meet somebody else. Were you at the church pick? Oh, you did? Oh, God bless you. This is the worst picnic I've attended. You know what happened? They didn't plan juice for the kids. Can you imagine? We are selfish. You know, the problem is this lady doesn't have a single child. And then they meet somebody else and say, does your church have church picnics? Yeah, we normally do. Oh, man, I'm glad you are not part of our church picnic. You know, guess what? They didn't bring juice for the kids. They were tired, thirsty, miserable. Hey, friends, that is not complaining. That is cultivating a complaining spirit. A complaining spirit divides. Complaining spirit creates disunity. Complaining spirit reduces trust in each other. Friends, there is a right way to complain. Go to the persons and say, I hope this doesn't happen again. And leave it there. And leave it there. Don't repeat it. Don't repeat it because you're sowing disunity. Second question is not really to the right person. The question is, is it right timing? You may meet the right person to talk to, but if they are not in the right space to listen to you. Rushing over and saying, you know, you need to know. No, find the right time. Where they fully will understand you, fully, uh, fully hear you. Is it the right time? And the third question is, is it the right place? What should be done personally? Don't go and do it in a group. What needs to be done is the privacy, don't do it in the hallway. Is it the right person? Is it the right time? Is it the right place? Then you will make a wise communication. The four-way test. What's number one? Is it true? Number two. 
Uh, right. I, 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 I've got good ears. What's the number three? And I have, what's number four? Friends, you try this. It is a great way to prevent a mouth letting words come out and become destructive. The tongue is small, but is very powerful. It can be powerful for the building up of the body of Christ can be powerful for the building up of the individual. You can be powerful for the strengthening of the leadership. It can be powerful to encouraging children to grow up in the fear of the Lord. Amen? Amen. All right, thank you, uh, Dr. TV. Praise the Lord. Uh, tongue is small, yet so powerful. That was a good reminder for all of us as we uh, face a brand new week ahead. Uh, truly, TV, we appreciate your time with us. Uh, we know that you will still be with us this afternoon uh, for the leaders, uh, but thank you. And uh, it is our prayer that uh, the Lord has blessed our hearts as we have been listening and pondering on those things that we have heard today from the word of the Lord. Uh, I'd like to invite us all to the uh, remembrance of the Lord's table. And if you don't have one of this yet, please quickly raise your hand. Our asterisk would help you to get to have one. All right. <clears throat> I'm also going to ask the uh, worship team to come up here, be ready. Uh, we'll be singing the Refiner's Fire. I think that's so appropriate uh, for this message as well. And for the series all throughout the, the month is Spirit-Filled Life. And one of those is one of the, uh, you know, the, uh, you would say, the fruit of the Spirit. One of the elements there uh, is self-control. And, and that speaks about, you know, how we control what we say. And uh, refiners, why we need His fire to refine our hearts. The Lord's Supper is really a, a proclamation. We, we proclaim what? Uh, we, we proclaim what God has done in Christ Jesus our Lord. And it's a formal proclamation as 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26 says, For as often as you eat of this bread and you drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so the act of taking the bread and also of drinking of the cup is a way to proclaim, bring into life, the message of the gospel. This is a graphic display of what Christ's death has accomplished for us and for the whole entire world. It points us backward to his death as the basis of our own salvation in him and only through him. And also, as we proclaim what he has done for us, it also reminds us, like what we just heard today, uh, when we meet together and join together in a meal where we remember the Lord's death, for us and his sacrifice for us, uh, Paul would expound that by saying if there is a disregard of our fellow Christians and for the church, it is a contradiction of what the Lord's Supper actually means. So let's love one another. Let's just embrace one another it's where we are at. Let's, let's give understanding, extend extra grace and really show love and speak love to one another. And uh, is there like a benefit to the one that would partake of this bread and of this cup? Yes, it can be a means or at least an occasion of a growth that we can experience in the Lord. We do not take the elements merely because the Lord commands it or we are just obliged to do so. Participation leads to contribute to our spiritual growth as well. So as we remember the Lord's death, his sacrifices for us, it reminds us that uh, there is that life that he alone can give. Like what TV said earlier that only the, one, the only one person, the only one God who could help us tame the tongue is the one who gave us the tongue. So the only way that we can continue to celebrate and remember what God has done for us in Christ Jesus is to celebrate him and to remember what he has done. He is the giver of life. He is the one who has forgiven us and sustains our life. So the Lord's Supper 
when it is properly administered, is a means of inspiring us in our faith to grow and our love for him and for one another as we continue to reflect on what he has done for us. John, or sorry, Charles Wesley wrote this hymn, and I'm going to read this for us before we partake of the elements. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? Died he for me who causes pain? For me who him to death pursued? Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Let us pray. Father, we give you thanks and we give you praise. Today, we will proclaim and we will declare truly your great love for us in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And as we remember his death and his sacrifice for us, Allow us to just be in a moment of having a grateful heart. Help us to live for him. Help us to impact lives for Jesus. And this bread and this cup helps us to remember and also to live out what it means not only to believe in Jesus, but also to suffer for his sake. So bless our hearts as we remember what you have done for us. So I'll prepare for the bread. If you can raise it up, the night that Jesus was having supper with his disciples, he says, this is my body broken for you. Eat it in remembrance of me. And every time you would eat this as Paul would expound, do it in remembrance of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's all partake of this bread and, pro and proclaim who Jesus is to the world together. Let's prepare for the cup. If you are able to raise it up, please do so. On that evening as well, he took a cup, he raised it up and says, this is the blood of the new covenant. Every time you drink of this cup, do this in remembrance of me. And so, Lord Jesus, we remember what you have done for us. For without the shedding of real blood, there could be no forgiveness of sins. So help us, O Lord, to be faithful till the end. And help us to love you, serve you, and love one another. As you have forgiven us, Lord, help us to forgive one another. And Lord, we pray that you would tame our tongue for your glory and for your honor, for the building up of the brothers and sisters. So I'll partake of this cup in remembrance of the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ together. Glory be to the Father, glory be to the Son, glory be to the Holy Spirit and all of God's people said, Amen. Let's all stand up. Let's sing this song prayerfully that Lord will purify our hearts.
all pray. Father, thank you for your dear presence with us today. Thank you for your word that was proclaimed today. Thank you for allowing us to worship you through the songs of honoring and lifting your name up in our midst. Thank you for the fellowship that we have with one another. Thank you that we can face a brand new week ahead of us, knowing fully well that you will be with us, that you will empower us to control our tongue, to live a life that is holy, that pleases you. So, Lord, purify our hearts so that we could live holy for your glory and for your honor. So that we could have the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So, brothers and sisters, as you go forth from this place, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ make us gracious. The love of God our Father make us loving. And the fellowship and the power of the Holy Spirit fill and empower us until we show in our lives more of the Spirit and the character of Jesus Christ today, tomorrow, and forever. And all of God's people said, Amen. The Lord bless us all. We'll see you next Sunday. Hallelujah. Amen. Got it.